loading into the vehicles began. The commander of the 2nd Battalion, Captain Kutov, spread his thick, short legs wide and looked every now and then at a large wristwatch in a white nickel-plated case. In the side, about ten meters away from the commander, a bunch of Red Army soldiers, liaison officers from each company, were standing, I was among them, the liaison of the machine gun company. We had not yet had time to get acquainted with the newly appointed battalion commander and did not know how to keep in his presence. He did not seem to pay any attention to us. There was no senior officer between us, the liaisons, so we were all on equal footing. The loading was over. Combat together with the nurse sat on the lead car. We were left completely without superiors. Then I made up my mind, as the oldest among all by age and military rank to take command of the group. The first thing that came to my mind was to disperse everyone to their units. So as soon as you stop, run straight to me, mm, I said. My car is second. If you're late, you're on your own. This is not a training, but a war. Standing next to me, soldier, Pranishchev said with a chuckle. Nurm, comrade chief petty officer, you don't know what war is and you scare others. Hearing the words of a former soldier struck me. I was confused for a minute. Then I got angry. I turned round and shouted to Pranishchev. Follow me. We got the worst seats in the car. We were sitting near the back. All the dust was settling on us. The mood was bad, the anger had not yet subsided. No, don't get angry, comrade chief petty officer, said Pranishchev. I don't like it when a man says something he doesn't know. For example, I am a tractor driver, but I would start telling a pilot about an aeroplane, ridiculous, and the war. I'll tell you a little about the liaisons too. In battle, how does it often happen? Everything gets mixed up. Mixed up, you don't know where the enemy is and where we are. What can a contact do? Where to run. Look around. If there is a retreat, again the fighters retreat together, one helps the other, but the liaison officer is always alone. Let's say there was a battle near Kastornaya. I ran from the regimental headquarters through the forest to the 2nd Battalion with a report, fulfilled the order. I went back along the same path, ran from bush to bush, hiding, and suddenly, fascist motorcyclists. What to do? I raised my rifle, then threw two grenades and dog go. So much for the liaison officer. In battle, a liaison officer is a figure, his own commander. And you're so? I was silent. What was there to say? And again, I remembered the first days of service in the Navy, the first tests of conscience. The March morning of the 38th year heralded a clear day. The Zolotoy Rog Bay sparkled with rainbow colours, but I was cloudy at heart. The reason was very simple. I wanted to be a minor or torpedoist and I was enlisted as a clerk in the artillery department. I deliberately spoilt my handwriting, made grammatical mistakes in classes. For this I was penalized and again forced to sit down at the books and make requests for various details. My boss was my namesake, Lieutenant Dmitri Zisev, and I decided to spoil his mood. When drawing up a timesheet application deliberately distorted the name of one detail, I wrote a completely obscene word and, having slipped this application for the lieutenant's signature, I calmed down. But not a day passed as this calmness turned against me. I could neither eat nor drink, thinking that the artillery department would find out my and Lieutenant Zaitsev would get hit for it. He would get hit hard because it was an open mockery of his superior. Evening came. Not being able to find a place for myself, I sluggishly wandered to my bunk. When my soul is heavy, then things do not go well. Everything turns out badly, and it is even more annoying. That evening, the duty officer of the barracks twice lifted me out of bed and made me put my uniform properly. I didn't sleep all night. I got up before the rise signal, completely forgetting that it was a violation of the daily routine. At the very exit from the barracks, I was stopped by a petty officer. Why did you get out of bed twenty minutes before the general rise? I stretched out in front of the petty officer according to the regulations, as we were taught at drill, and reported, I have an upset stomach. In that case, run to the galley. At the morning review, the petty officer called me out of the ranks and sent me to the medical unit to treat my upset stomach. The doctor revealed my cunning simply. He looked my tongue, rubbed my stomach and wrote to the petty officer. For six days, Red Fleet Zitsev Sev should be raised 30 minutes before rising and used for household chores. For six days, I dragged water from the river in buckets to the wash basins. On Saturday, I was again taken to the medical centre. Piotr still listened to me very carefully. 
He asked me how my stomach worked, whether there was no diarrhea, constipation, whether nausea was not suffocating. Maybe there was heartburn. I replied, I feel fine. Please cancel such a therapeutic procedure. Finally, a messenger from the headquarters came to pick me up, to report to Lieutenant Zaitsev, the chief of combat catering. I ran, and from the threshold I report, Hmm, comrade lieutenant, Red Fleet Zaitsev has arrived on your orders. The lieutenant looked at me for a long time with his beautiful, kind eyes. I see that you have arrived. But I can't understand you, what kind of man you are. How could you work as a civilian accountant, having no conscience behind your soul? You and I are in the same Komsomol organization. We are almost the same age. Life gave us the same surname. I trusted you in your work as myself, as my own brother, and for my trustworthiness you punished me cruelly. The lieutenant's words turned my gut inside out. In reality, the lieutenant was by nature a soft man, fair and demanding. A year ago he had graduated with honours from the military school, and as an excellent student he had been sent to work independently in the school. Now he is transferred to another unit with a demotion. The reason, negligence. That's what it was, you, said the lieutenant, putting in front of me the application made by my hand. As you can see, the result was sad. Your cases showed a negligent attitude to service, absent-mindedness, superficial knowledge of the material part. Chum shame I was ready to fall through the ground. I asked for an apology and the strictest punishment. The lieutenant looked at me with his pure, clear eyes, smiled faintly and quietly said, No, I will not punish you. Let your own conscience punish you. She is the supreme judge. Yes, it seems that there is no more severe punishment than the torment of one's own conscience. In the conditions of military service, the life of every military man, if he wants to be a real military man, is built not only according to regulations and instructions, but also according to his own conscience. The loss of conscience is tantamount to the most serious crime. This is the conclusion I made for myself after that stupid prank against Lieutenant Dmitri Zaitsev, and from now on I will be looking for an opportunity to redeem my guilt before him all my life. And now, when the war is going on, when Stalingrad is blazing in front of my eyes, and the words of a soldier tested by fire sound in my ears. In battle, a liaison officer is a figure, a commander in his own right. I only have to swear an oath before my own conscience, to be a faithful and honest executor of my commander's will. Without this, there is nothing to think about, Victor. The column turned to a country road. For about thirty minutes they rolled along the lowland, overgrown with bushes, the lakes scattered here and there beckoned to us. After the dusty, hot road, it was a heavenly thing to bathe and rest on the shore. Suddenly from the lead car there were conditional signals, and the whole convoy rushed away in different directions. We stopped under bushes. The road ahead and the sky above it were empty. We never understood what they were afraid of. The battalion unloaded quickly, without fuss and noise. We shouldered the combat equipment, formed up in groups of three and left the bushes for the very country road on which we had just travelled. The day was coming to an end, the heat had subsided, and even the thirst that had long tormented everyone seemed to have subsided. Thunder was heard, the air smelled of cinders, explosives, and something else unpleasant. The battalion turned off the country lane and went deep into the forest, along the paths trampled by cattle and then from behind the bushes appeared men in civilian clothes. They walked, barely stepping, ragged, dirty, bandaged with grey bandages from dust. These were the civilians of Stalingrad on their way to the hospital. The sailors, who had not yet seen the horrors of war, looked at them with pain. From the edge of the forest, in which we disguised ourselves, we could see Stalingrad. Between us and the burning city lay the Volga. We could hear artillery shells. Machine guns were relentlessly firing. Fascist planes continuously bombed the factory district. What would be our first battle? A string of wounded soldiers dragged along the paths. We wanted to talk to them to ask them how it was, but their appearance spoke for itself. They walked as if not noticing us, and we were waiting for someone to come up. Suddenly a sailor appeared from behind the bushes. He stopped, looked around and saw us. He came over. Turned out to be a petty officer. His head was bandaged. His left arm, strangely short, was bandaged. There were brown blood stains on his tattered calfskin. The right trouser leg of the pant leg is torn from the bottom to the knee. The anchor on a thick naval plaque was pressed into the middle. The petty officer sat down next to us and asked for a smoke. We started talking. 
Wait a minute, said the petty officer suddenly, having heard that we were Pacific Islanders. Have you met Sasha Lebedev? My brother, is there no such person among you? We have one, answered the Ukrainian Orim Vasilchenko. What? Hmm, the petty officer jumped up. Maybe a namesake? He plays the accordion well, whines. In short, a cheerful fellow, he won't let you get bored. That's him, Sashka. But he's not in the company now. Hmm, how come? Where is he? Three men immediately rushed to look for Sasha. Before the Stalingrad battles, petty officer Ivan Lebedev had served in the Northern Fleet and his brother Alexander in the Pacific Fleet. They came from Stalingrad. When fascists approached their native city, the brothers asked to join the Stalingrad and now. Oh, comrade petty officer, exclaimed Sailor Mishamasayev excitedly. Mio! Lebedev Jr. was running towards us. Vanya! Mastish art. The brothers kissed each other. In a trembling voice, Ivan said, And I can't give you a real hug. Alexander looked at his brother's shortened arm. Where is it you? There, Ivan pointed towards Stalingrad. How is it there? It's hard. But we're holding on. Ivan Lebedev looked at the sailors huddled around us. And we'll hold out, brothers, we'll hold out my word of honour, and don't look at my arm. The Krauts paid dearly for it. From the story of Ivan Lebedev, we saw the battle in the area of the village of Krasny Oktyaba. Turns they fight for every street, for every house. Everything is covered with fire. It's hard to breathe. Sparks fall on shoulders, get behind a collar, clothes catch fire. Petty officer Lebedev saw how the fascist officer took out a pistol, aimed at the commander. Lebedev rushed forward, blocked the commander and rushed at the fascist with a knife. The bullet struck Lebedev's left arm, but his right one reached the fascist's chest at the same moment. Having lost an officer, the Hitlerites were confused for a moment. But it is not known what would have happened next, if at that moment there was no horror. Ours went into the attack. Lebedev was silent, and it seemed to us as if we had been on the right bank, participated in hand-to-hand -hand fights, repulsed fascist attacks, went in counterattacks. I did not notice when Brigade Commissar Zhukov approached our group. He stood leaning against a tree and listened together with everyone. And then he came up to Lebedev, shook his hand. Thank you, Comrade Petty Officer. You read a real report on courage for our youth? Then he looked at us. I see that the soldier's uniform hasn't been instilled in you. His voice was soft. This until dark, Comrade Brigade Commissar. We were soldiers, but now we have turned into sailors again. The company commander justified himself. Yes. In the old days, Russian soldiers used to put on clean underwear before the battle. You, he said, the commissar thoughtfully. In the darkness, they came to the very bank of the Volga. They lay down on the warm sand near the water. The Volga was picking over small pebbles on the bank. They were rustling, as if whispering among themselves. A shesh, h, shesh, a, h, o, h. From Mamayev Kurgan, the traces of large caliber machine gun bursts were flying in all directions. We can't reach them, Vasil. They are squelching in the water, said Orim Vasilchenko, who was lying next to them, commenting on the flight of bullets. On the right side of the crossing, there was a machine gun firefight. In the ravine Dolgom, between the petrol tanks, machine gunners were working, beating off a steady beat, and at the bottom of the ravine, behind the road, grenades were exploding. The engines of the night bombers rumbled overhead. Each new burst of a mine or a shell threw hot air and tossed aside. The most unpleasant thing in war is to lie without action under enemy fire. Arim did not lie down. He tossed from side to side and grumbled. Well, what are we waiting for here? We should have swung over while it was dark, and we were lying here waiting for sleep. Senior Lieutenant Bolsheshapov shouted loudly at Okrim. More units are coming. You're not the only one. You can lie down. And everyone fell silent, understood. Only the quiet conversation on the crossing became audible. The city was burning. Against the background of the flames, we could see the shadows of soldiers running through. Ours or Germans? No one knew. To the crossing approached the transport of the 2nd Battalion. Overloaded wagons up to the hubs buried in the sand. Horses were exhausted and could not tear them from their seats. A company of machine gunners approached, and the convoy moved to the crossing. A boat appeared, and a barge was moored to it. Its high sides were pretty battered by shrapnel. 
Loading went quickly, in complete silence. Machine guns were prepared for battle. In the middle of the barge stacked boxes of ammunition. Petty officer Baybayev loaded into the holds, directly into the water, boxes of American stew, the second front. The sailors laughed heart-heartedly. Yeoman, what are you doing? The second front will choke. Pumps stood on the bow and stern of the whole barge. Sailors were pumping out the water that had seeped through the holes. Hammers were banging inside the barg. The gaps were caulked, and the holes were plugged with plugs wrapped with soot. There was a thud of machinery. The boat shuddered, the tugboat strained, the barge shuddered, creaked, and like a tired nag, followed. A small wave came over the boat, struck the iron board and scattered with noise somewhere in the darkness. The thick darkness of the night pressed on their eyes like a bandage, but everyone stared intensely into the black, boiling breadth of the river, trying to see what was ahead. To the left and right they could hear the sailors quietly splashing their oars. Behind the boats on ropes dragged planks, logs. Sailors from the company of machine gunners were holding on to them. The crossing was without losses. All as one, the Pacific swung across the Volga into the fire-breathing Stalingrad. It was on the night of 22 September 1942. The boat crashed with its nose into the coastal sand. The motor shuddered for the last time and fell silent. Only the water behind the stern continued to squelch. There it was, the long-awaited right bank. A rocket flashed in the sky. Its bright light slid on the steel helmets of the fighters. Everyone froze. The rocket went out, and the shore came alive again. By five o'clock in the morning, our whole 284th Rifle Division had crossed the Volga. I still cannot understand why the fascist artillerymen and mortars did not disturb us with a single shot on the open surface of the river. Maybe because we did not give ourselves away by a single sound or movement. Or maybe Hitlerites lost their vigilance, thinking that the Russian army at Stalingrad was defeated, scattered. The artillery had gone behind the Volga to the left bank. Only separate groups of communist suicide bombs remained in the ruins of the city, and the crossing of new units was impossible. What they thought, it is not known, but it is a fact that our division managed to cross without losses. Now there is no doubt. We will soon enter the battle, the first baptism of fire of sailors on land in a burning city. How will it begin and how will it end? Personally, I'm ready for anything. I'll fight as my conscience dictates. Let my comrades assess what kind of conscience I have, holy or clean, in the course of the battle. But I repeat to myself for the last time, I will not let you down, I will not retreat even in front of death. Probably my friends from the Pacific think the same about themselves. I look at them, and in my ears I hear the voice of the announcer who was transmitting the next report of the Sovin Form Bureau on the radio. Our troops have left Sevastopol. I heard this heavy news when I was in Vadaviva stock, receiving my allowance for May 1942 in the bank, and immediately in front of the cash desk behind my back, sounded for me no less severe sentence than the announcer's message about Sevastopol. No. So I say, any literate woman can carry money, but it's time to bring such charismatic guys to the war. That's right, Luka Egorovich, supported by my familiar grandfather Fady, a locksmith and stoker of the district bathhouse. I, for example, work on two responsible positions. The whole bathhouse is on my shoulders, well, if they asked me, Fady, go to the bank, get cash for the team, would it be hard for me? And I wouldn't keep such slackers on women's work. Oh, how hard it became for me to serve in a peaceful city far from the front. I returned to the unit and was ready to throw all of the money wherever I could, so that I could be sent to the front as a penalty officer, and probably it could have happened like that. If at that moment I had not met the base commander who told me that I would be replaced the other day, that the fleet command had decided to satisfy the request of the Komsomo members of the Bay Mo to form a company of volunteers to be sent to the front. No, thank you. Burst out of my chest, otherwise I would have choked with joy. The commander smiled, took out a pack of Bellomor from his pocket and handed it to me. We lit from one match and took a drag. Hmm, frankly speaking, I envy you and your Komsomol friends. Hmm, said the base commander. I also submitted four reports with a request to be sent to the front. On the fourth one, there is such a resolution. I read it with my own eyes. Explain to Comrade Nikolaev that he must understand where we are and what task we are performing. If he does not understand, we will deal with him in the party order, up to and including expulsion. 
The commander of the base, Lieutenant Commander Nikolaev, was a restless man by nature. He took the slightest malfunctions and failures to heart. He was upset, so he often spent all day and night at work without closing his eyes. Due to overwork during one year of the war, he had two wrinkles cut deeper on his forehead. Even more strongly marked scar, a trace of Hazen, which snaked from the right eyebrow to the cheek, and the clever and caring commander, who had given eighteen years of hard service, this time seemed to me like my own far. He instructed me how to act in battle. The main thing was not to be timid and be cautious. While waiting for a replacement, the time dragged painfully slow. I counted literally every minute. During the night I had time to prepare a full financial report for handing over to the new chief and in the morning, at dawn, went to the sea. At this time, the dawn on the sea comes somehow especially beautiful. The beauty of the dawn begins with the appearance of a small, barely visible, bright, shining point. It can't be called a Zarnitsa, which I am used to seeing in my native Urals. This dot is as small as a mouse's eye, but it burns so brightly that the sky flares up around it. This star is not a simple heavenly luminary. No, it is a real scout. It paves the way for the sun. When the mouse eye has burst into flame and grown into an all-seeing eye, it emits so much light winking that it is enough to light up a narrow strip of new morning in the sky. It was on that particular morning that the star of happiness, the solar scout, seemed to smile on me alone. Before my eyes all living things were rejoicing, turning towards the sun, and how could it be otherwise? After all, I was to go to the active army not today, tomorrow. Having bathed in the cold ocean water, I ran back to the location of the unit, here everyone already knew that twenty Komsomol members of our base, including me, were going to the active army. There was very little time left. The send-off was truly military. By rank and age among our team I was the oldest. That's why I was appointed commander of a squad, with which I joined a battalion of marines of the Pacific Fleet. And here we are already in Stalingrad, on the right bank of the Volga. Will I smile here that very star which in Vladivostok's sailors call a scout of the sun? The crossing of the division is over. We are waiting for the order to enter the battle. Until we received the combat task, we stayed in place, at the berths, as now I see a young, white-haired, snub-nosed captain who placed the sailors of our part on the steep bank. We lay one to one. An hour passed, a second one. The night is coming to an end. Sailors are well orientated by the celestial luminaries, but the sky is smoky, and it is difficult to determine whether the dawn is near. The officers are visibly worried, and we are still lying absolutely without action, and we ourselves are getting more and more worried. Soon we must enter the battle. But where is the enemy, where is his front line? No one at that time realized to take the initiative to scout, nor did our commander Vasily cut off. He was lying on his stomach next to me. On the other side sat Senior Lieutenant Vasily Bolshishapov. Early morning. Distant objects were becoming clearer. The petrol tanks were clearly visible to our left. What is behind them? Who is there? Above the tanks, the railway bed, there are empty wagons. Who is lurking behind them? Finally, the observers of German mortar batteries spotted us. Mines flew on the bank of the Volga in our cluster. Enemy planes appeared in the air and began to throw fragmentation bombs. The sailors scrambled along the bank, not knowing what to do. Lieutenant Nikolai Logvininko, Battalion Commander Vasily Kotov, and I managed to jump into a deep bomb crater. We pressed ourselves to the ground, lying down, and fascist aviation was hammering, only stones were flying. On the right and left we heard the groans of the wounded. A few minutes later it was Herk. The deputy division commander has been killed. No, we couldn't go on like this, and then a Katyusha hit from behind the Volga. Well done artillerymen, just with the burst of the last shell. Senior Lieutenant Bolshipov jumped out on the hill and shouted, Hmm, for the motherland. Raising his pistol above his head, he rushed to the petrol tanks, where the fascist machine gunners were huddled. As if a spring threw me on my feet, I don't remember how I found myself next to Bolshipov. Things the sailors on our right and left followed us. Fear and indecision were removed like a hun. A friendly attack makes a timid man brave. On the left, a fascist machine gun rumbled, hiding somewhere in the ruins near the Dolgogo ravine. Chains of sailors pressed to the ground. The attack was stalled. Bolshipov ordered me to sneak to the ruins and throw grenades at the machine gun nest. When the Nazi machine gun was silenced, the sailors, who were advancing on the left flank, 
again rose to the attack. Having noticed the accumulation of our infantry at the petrol tank, the fascists opened a massive mortar and artillery fire. Then bombs flew from dive bombers. Flames rose above the base. Petrol tanks began to burst. The ground caught fire. Above the chains of attacking sailors, with a deafening roar, flickered giant flames. Everything is on fire. One more minute, and we will turn into coals. Into Let's go. Let's go. Caught in the fire, soldiers and sailors on the move tore off their burning clothes, but did not throw weapons. An attack of naked burning men, what the fascists thought of us at that moment. I don't, maybe they took us for devils or for saints, whom even fire does not take, and that's why they fled without looking back. We knocked them out of the village adjacent to the petrol tank and stopped on the westernmost street, lying down among the small individual houses that made up the street. Here someone tossed me a cloak tent, and I covered myself in some way. Immediately, the commander of the regiment, Major Mitalev, directed the main blow of his battalions along the ravine Dolgomu to the hardware factory, to the area of the ice storage, and to the height 102, Mameyev Kurgan. In the Dolgom ravine, our company established elbow contact with the machine gun company of the 13th Guards Division, which was engaged in fierce fighting for the city centre. In the air, still circled fascist planes. There was an air battle. Fascist dive bombers stormed the plant Red October, and the northern slopes of Mame of Kurgan. The ground was burning there too. From the hot air, the soldiers' lips cracked. Their mouths dried up, their scorched hair stuck together, the teeth of the comb were bending. Being but the Italian commander, Captain Kothoff. The order was fulfilled. The petrol tanks were repulsed. The unfinished red building was taken over. The office of the metalware factory was captured. The battles were going on in the shops and breaches of the asphalt and metalware factories. There came an hour's respite. The uniforms were brought, found buried in the sand a little burnt my calfskin. The city is on fire. Flames are raging over every house, over factory buildings, something is burning at the tractor plant. I sit and, without looking, feel myself, my chest under my calfskin, my legs. Above me, thick black smoke is rising high into the sky. Then it slowly moved along the shore to the west. Mamey of Kurgan was covered with a black blanket, I could not see the bushes in the area of shooting galleries at all. Smoke clouds descend lower and lower. Smoke crawls into the ruins of houses, into cellars, fills the trenches and stretches along the ravine to the water. Fascist planes continue to bomb the city. We hide among the ruins, in pits under the foundations of walls. Then we run over to the outermost workshop of the plant and take shelter under the beds of machines. Telling and bombing has subsided. We are again in the attack. We are engaged in an unequal fight. Hand-to-hand -hand combat begins brutal fleeting. That's where the science taught to us on the other shore came in handy. Again a respite. We look at the ruins of the factory. Piles of bricks, twisted metal beams. And suddenly I see a girl. Small, thin, about twelve years old. Her thin legs are scratched to the blood. Her blue dress, obviously from someone else's shoulder, is torn. Her red shoes, also torn, are worn barefoot. The girl is walking ahead of the wounded soldiers, leading them somewhere. We had seen many paths in the ruins before and wondered where they were going. A mine exploded with a crack, shrapnel and small crumbs of bricks scattered like a fan. At the same time, bursting bullets clicked. But the girl kept walking as if she didn't notice anything. I fell behind the machine gun, pressed the trigger, opened return fire in the direction of the fascists. This girl is remembered to me forever. Senior Lieutenant Bolshishapov was interested in where the wounded soldiers were hiding from the bombardment. What path did the girl use to get to them? And what if this path will be discovered by fascists and they will quietly sneak into our rear? The company commander order. Redutov and Zaitiv scout where the cellars go out and how they can be used. We picked up automatic rifles, strapped three grenades to our belts and dived into the ruins. I went first, and Rutov behind me lit the way with a torch. We waded among the ruins, ducking under bent trusses. We came to a massive iron door, opened it, and the smells of paraffin, engine oil, and some other heavy odour hit my nose. Rutov stopped. Wow, wow, you could hang an axe. They stood for a while, switched on the torch, looked around. A narrow long corridor, there's another door on the right side. Behind it we could hear talking, moaning, who's in there, people inside or outside, they pressed on the door. It wouldn't budge. 
It was closed from the inside. Rutoft put his ear to the keyhole, listened for a long time. A loud knock echoed through the cellar. From somewhere from the side came a rough, smoky bass. Who, who's coming? By the voice I recognized my naval comrade, Nikolai Koropi from the 1st Battalion, joyfully shout. No, Kolya, open up, it's me and Ryutov. We'll open up now, Kolya replied. But the door was still locked. Sasha Rutov knocked again, but no one answered. It was quiet all around, only from time to time the ground shook, as if to remind us that there was a bombardment upstairs. Heavy artillery was beating. At last the iron bolt rattled, and the door swung open. A half-undressed man stood before me. He had burned blisters on his face and chest. His right arm hung from a kerchief tied round his neck. This was my naval friend, Kolya Kurupi, formerly an accountant of a collective farm in Poltevshina, a joker and a joker. There were about twenty of them here. All of them had already received first aid. Nurse Klava Svintseva and two orderlies were taking care of the wounded. But, of course, the guys had to be urgently sent over the Volga to the medical centre. It turned out that from this cellar it was possible to get to the Volga by one more way. First through the labyrinths of ruins to individual houses, then go down to the Dolgi Ravine, and there to the crossing. Just a hand in hand, this is the way the orderlies came here when the fascists occupied the shops of the factory. Upstairs, the fascists, and in the basement, our wounded. Good neighbourhood, no snakes and birds. Kolya Koropi found strength to amuse us. If we could find a passage here for the battalion, knock out the fascists from above and rescue the wounded. Look here, called me Ritov. I look at some square pipe. The width is more than two metres. The height is about one metre and fifty. Yes, not less. My height is one metre sixty-five, and I pass through with my head slightly ducked. The air is clean, it's easy to breathe. I can even feel a slight draught. We walk in the dark. With my left hand I hold on to a thick cable in lead braid, suspended on brackets under the ceiling. My right hand is clutching the neck of the rifle butt. The cable rose steeply upwards, and five metres later I bumped into a brick wall. I fumbled with my hand and found a wooden ladder. Four steps brought me to the exit of the collector. A square hole covered by a thick sheet of iron, with light shining through the gap. From here I could hear the firefight upstairs. Machine gun and machine gun bursts, grenades exploding. Where are we? I decided to look out, to look around. I tried to move the sheet with my shoulder, but there was no way. The sheet was stuck. Sasha Rutov came up. The two of us adapted, waiting for the moment. One after the other, two strong explosions. We pressed together. The sheet moved a little with a treacherous thunder. Fortunately, Hitler's soldiers didn't pay attention. A gap was formed, but so narrow that only I could get through. The heavy Sasha could not get through. I stuck my head out, looked around. It turns out that we snuck into the tool room. Cabinets, racks with tools and various parts. From here, you can see what is done in the Lathen assembly shop. In the Lathen Germans, many it seems, the whole company, gathered as if for lunch, in the hands of wokes and flasks, taking shelter behind the machines, they are waiting for food carriers and do not notice that a Russian sailor counts them by their heads like sheep. Hastily sketched out a plan of the enemy's location, his firing points, the path of passage. With this paper, Rutov went back to report to the company commander, and I stayed to watch. Paper fell into my hand. I read, pass. They printed special passes for the defenders of Stalingrad. On these passes, Russian soldiers could at any time on favourable terms lay down their arms and surrender. If the defender of Stalingrad accidentally falls into captivity, he would be shot on the spot, and if he came with a pass, sent to the rear. On the other side, there was a text in German. They translated it for me later. It was written to all soldiers of the Führer. Russian soldiers and officers who presented a pass for surrender, disarmed them without any conditions and send them to a camp for prisoners of war. About twenty minutes passed. The Nazis began their lunch. I counted sixty-five heads. They had lunch, clicked lighters, smoked cigarettes. Where is Rutov? Will not ours have time to catch them at such an opportune moment? Suddenly Hitlerites shouted, scattered. Their attention was attracted by a noise in the opposite side from me. Who made the noise and what for? It turns out that Bolshisap have needed this noise. The sailors had already managed to accumulate in the tool room, and in the neighbouring cellar. They were waiting for the Germans to be distracted by the false noise, to turn their backs. 
At the command of the senior lieutenant simultaneously flew more than 30 grenades. Machine guns rumbled. In a few minutes there was not a single living kraut left in the lathe shop. But till the evening we cleared this section of the factory and strengthened our positions. Now in the hands of Germans remained asphalt concrete plant, northwest of the metal works, transformer room and part of the boiler room. They still held the bridge and the embankment of the railway that wraps around Mame of Kurgan from the north. We began to put ourselves in order to send the wounded from the basement of the hardware factory and to prepare an infirmary there for Klava Svintsova. So ended for me the first battle, or rather the first combat day in Stalingrad. For a whole week, five, six times a day, Hitlerites frantically attacked the metalware factory. Separate parts of the factory territory changed hands several times. Germans occupied them during the day, and we occupied them at night. It was especially bad for us in those days, when the enemy managed to gain a foothold on the top of Mamayev Kurgan and set up observation points there. From there the fascists could see the crossing, our positions and could fire artillery. On the height of the mound all approaches to the office of the hardware factory were visible, and also in hundred meters from our dugout there was a tower. Hitler's rangefinders sometimes appeared on it too. They also spotted the entrance to our dugout. At eight o'clock in the morning the artillery and mortar shelling began. Mines and shells were bursting near the dugout itself, crumbling everything that was above. Trees that had once been planted along the tram line turned into charred and split posts. In the rails, torn from the ground by the blast wave, curled up into tangles. Tram cars without windows and doors, with torn off wheels, were lying like broken children's toys. Among the tram cemetery mangled rails. You can see helmets, scattered shell casings, boxes of ammunition and grenades, gas mask and sanitary bags, lying dead. But I almost indifferently go past all this with one desire, to get to the dugout and fall asleep. I am dead tired. I think I sleep on the move. In the dugout, through the ceilings, I hear deafly. Enemy artillery and aviation begin to process the front line of our defence. The ground rumbles and groans. Now my comrades, those who are upstairs, must run, crawl as close as possible to the enemy's front line. This is the only salvation in this situation. Teague presses me against the wall of the dugout. I squat down, sleep overcomes me. What power it has in it, neither fists nor a machine gun can fight it off. I crawl to the center of the dugout, something soft falls under my head. I, I fall into a doze. No, I'm not sleeping, but continuing to fight with sleep. I see everything, hear everything, only at some distance from this noisy reality. Explosions of bombs and shells shake the dugout, and it seems to me that I am traveling in a shaky teplushka with my comrades. Somewhere near Omsk the train stopped. The head of the train summoned the foreman on duty to his carriage. I sat down on a bench next to a girl. Beautiful, smiling in military uniform with four triangles on her buttonholes. A nurse. I sit and feel the warmth of her shoulder. The echelon started again. The carriage is tossing from side to side. I like it. The girl does not seem to be upset by this shaking. The tenderness of her blue eyes is already beginning to stir my heart. Meanwhile, the head of the echelon continues to explain the importance of our echelon. They say, The enemy can let us down if we let our guard down. So to prevent this from happening, do not let unauthorized persons near your wagon. Wagon inspection masters are allowed, but watch what they do. The briefing was already over, but the stop was not yet. All those present got up from their seats. I got up too. Showing courtesy, I give way to my stranger, taking her under my elbow. She felt my hand and discreetly pressed it to her side. Having understood each other, we vigorously began to push between the sailors and soon found ourselves in the vestibule. I called my name. Vasily. Maria, Missy answered, but you call me like all my friends. Masha, I'll call you Vasya. How good it is that your name is like that. There are millions of such names in Russia. It's true, but the first sailor I met was the one whose name would bring me happiness. Let's swear that throughout the war we'll help each other like brother to sister. You will not offend me and you will not let others. I looked in her big radiant eyes with astonishment and thought. Why does this beauty need my friendship? I aid my sailor's words until the end of the war to guard and protect her as a sister from dishonor and offense. Masha raised her hand and swore that until the end of the war she would obey me like a kindred brother. At this word the train shuddered as if from a blow. The brakes screeched. 
The buffer steel plates spoke to each other. The echelon stopped. At that moment I seemed to have fallen asleep, or rather, the reality of the meeting with Maria Loskutova left my memory, then came back again. It came back through the dream in an amazing sequence. At one of the stations, Sailor Karopi tore a nail from the index finger of his left hand with a door. First aid to the injured sailor was rendered in the Teploshka. Nikolai Starostin volunteered to accompany the injured man to the medical wagon. I, as a watchman, could not miss such a moment not to look in on Masha Loskutova. That day she was on duty in the ambulance car. Before reaching the station, the train stopped at the semaphore. We jumped out and ran along the train to the 15th car, which was attached ahead of ours. It was the only hard compartment car in our echelon. It housed the headquarters of our unit, a pharmacy and an operating theatre. It was not easy to get in. When we jumped on the foot of the carriage, our train began to gain a decent speed. Stairostin knocked. The door did not open immediately. The guard looked at us, sternly wagged his finger through the glass, and only then the door opened in front of us. The blood-splattered hand had a magical effect on the sailor's consciousness. Olas received the wounded sailor, he shouted loudly, banging his fist. Nurse! The door of the neighbouring compartment opened. Masha came out. When she saw the blood on Nikolay's arm, she did not notice me, as if she had not noticed me, concentrating only on the blotches that had turned brown. Mess it down for a minute. She said to Nikolai, Hmm. I'll prepare a fresh bandage. Starostin quickly hid behind the door in the pharmacy, and probably immediately forgot about us. Kurupi as an injured man sat on the sofa, his arm lying on the table. Masha quickly put on a white dressing gown, put a snow-white cap on her head. We admired her beauty. Even a simple dressing gown coloured her sister's very handsome figure, and Kersovi boots with wide shanks did not spoil the beauty of this small, mobile, fighting sister. Then Mache opened a common notebook in a black binding with a clasp, and a Nature Ceremi? New Kerapi, Nikolai answered. No, first name and patronymic. Hmm. I'll tell you my first name and patronymic, but first tell me your name. Nikolai answered with a question, obviously giving away his intention to get acquainted with her. Oh, these sailors? Give me your hand. Masha said in a sterner voice, Sister, you say your name. I will not only give you my hand, I will give you my heart. Nikolai continued. Masha frowned. My name is, and didn't Vasya tell you anything? Nikolai reply, No. It's all right, he'll tell me. I don't need your heart, but put your broken hand on the table. Nikolai, like a schoolboy, put his hand on the table and was silent. The wound was not dangerous. The dressing was over, and it was possible to go to their own teplushka, but the train kept rushing and rushing without stopping, rattling on the switches. The duty officer on duty at the headquarters came and put us out of the compartment into the vestibule. Again something rattled and clattered. I seemed to be thrown into the air and now I think I really fell asleep. I slept like a sailor soundly. I woke up hungry. I spread my arms out and there was no one around. No one responds to my voice. Quiet, dark. I sat up, leaned my back against the wall, trying to remember where I was. I took a kit set out of my pocket, rolled a cigarette, searched all my pockets. But there were no matches. Where are the matches? I remembered Mikhail Masayev's bad habit. Whatever he took from a comrade he wouldn't give back. He slipped it into his pocket. I had given a box of matches to Masayev in the lathe shop that morning. I grasped this moment and began to trace what happened next. At last I remembered how I had entered the dugout, how long I'd been looking for a place closer to the exit to breathe fresh air. But happiness did not smile on me. I reached the middle of the dugout and fell down among the sleepers, moored blindly. Out of anger at Mishka, I threw my cigarette to the side. He got up, took two steps, ran into the wall and began to climb it. My feet kept clinging, stepping on something. I bent down, groped. I broke into a cold sweat. It was the dead. The sleeves of my uniform became sticky. I realized that I was sleeping among the corpses. Could it be that my comrades considered me killed and threw me into a mass grave? Such a thought made my heart ache. No, it was nothing. I started to move along the wall further. The wall ended with a heap of sand. I lay on the sand for a while, calmed down, went the other way, and again I ran into the wall. There was no way out. In vain I crawled, scratched the concrete walls with my fingers. All around me were walls and rubble. 
No way out. Then demolition shovel came to hand. Hurry up and dig. But wherever I hit, everywhere the blade of the shovel hits a tree. Trapped from all sides. I moved away from the boards and logs for a metre and a half or two metres and started shoveling again. I threw the earth to the middle of the dugout. I pushed it under myself. I wanted to get out to take a breath of fresh air, to look at the sky, to see the guys. It's better to be killed in battle than buried alive. I'm digging hard. The logs are piling up again. What can you do with a sapper shovel? I'm back in the middle of the dugout. It's getting stuffy. I fall on the cold, loose sand. I try to remember where the exit should be. I can't get my head together. My ears are ringing, and it's getting harder to breathe every minute. And suddenly the thought burns. The longer I lie idle, the sooner death will come. I must get fresh air. I take a shovel, and again crawl between the logs into my hole. I work without rest, like a mole crawling further and further. A block of sand collapsed behind me and crushed my legs. It seems to have cut off the exit to the dugout. I'm shorter there. Some lump rolled up and became across the throat, neither to inhale nor to exhale. Multicolored sparks flicker in my eyes, rainbow circles float. From the last strength I rest my feet on the log and hit the wall with the shovel. One, another, a third, the shovel falls into the void. Another spurt and at last, but my strength left me and I hit my face on the ground. When I looked up it was a dark night. I greedily gulped the fresh air, unable to get it between the logs and planks. I had made a good hole. Through it I got out of the dugout. Tracer bullets were flying towards the Volga. From the windows of the lower floor of the office of the hardware factory, fascist machine guns were firing. Rockets flashed in the sky, illuminating the damaged tramway line and broken tram cars. Now it became clear to me where I was and how to act. To get out of here to my men, I had to blow up the machine guns. I went back to the dugout again. I need grenades, but no matter how hard I tried, no matter how much I crawled on the floor, I couldn't find grenades. It's dark. I need light to look around. Need ma I started searching the pockets of the dead. In one pocket I rustled a box and a kissy with Macorka. I was glad to find it, made a cigarette, struck a match, and lit it. And at the same second I noticed a Katyusha lamp in a recess of the wall, and a box of matches next to it. I lit the lamp, began to tear up the sand, looking for grenades. Near the wall on the floor, half filled with sand, there were automatic rifles, cartridges scattered everywhere, ready discs for automatic rifles, and among this warehouse, a box with F1 grenades. Having filled my pockets and gas bag with them, I crawled out of the hole. From the window of the office of the hardware factory still beats fascist machine gun. I crawled from funnel to funnel and pressed myself against the foundation of the office. A rocket flashed up, plucked a 45 mm cannon out of the darkness. Another rocket, and simultaneously both machine guns started to work. One was firing in the eastern direction, the other in the western direction. The flares were going off continuously. The terrain was illuminated all the time, and this gave me a good look at everything. It became clear to me that the Hitlerites had cut into our defence, turning the office of the hardware factory into their stronghold. One machine gun was installed in the window of the ground floor, another somewhere near and a little higher. They started working again, and I lifted myself up. I pressed my back against the wall and threw a grenade through the window, then another, then a third. I got bolder, got more comfortable, started throwing more and more. From the east and west sides of the office, a horror sounded. It went into the attack, as it turned out later, our second and fourth companies. The fascist stronghold was liquidated. The office was back in our hands. When the commanders gathered in its basement, they began to clarify who came up first and blew up the machine guns. They were judging, but they didn't think about me. At the entrance to the office I met Nikolai Logvinenko. He was asking the soldiers about something scribbling in his notebook. I realized that Nikolai was collecting material to describe the battle and for this purpose he had already written more than a dozen pages in his painstaking handwriting. Seeing me, Lugvinenko was stunned, then grabbed me by the sleeve and dragged me to the company commander. We went down into the basement. Senior Lieutenant Bolshashapov broke away from the map, raised his head. I looked at Bolshashapov with some surprise. Why was he looking so intently at my face? What did he want to ask? Alive, look. Alive, he shouted joyfully. I looked round who was he talking about, 
and Bolsha Shapov jumped out from behind the table, ran up to me, hugged me, kissed me. Masya, we buried you. Look at yourself, said the nurse Natasha Terdokubova and gave me a corner of the mirror. I looked terrible. My face was dirty, smeared with blood. Captain Kotov came into the cellar, looked at me, then at the company commander. What's that? Is he wounded or what? No, comrade captain. Our chief petty officer from the other side of the world returned, replied with a smile Bolshishapov. Hey, go put yourself in order, then tell me what happened to you, ordered me combat. In the corner of the cellar stood a large fire barrel with water. Fascists, probably, also used water from this barrel, and I did not want to touch it, but there was nothing to do. Nikolai Logvinenko had a safety razor blade, and someone had found a blade that wasn't very fresh. A scrap of bandage served as an anointing. I shaved, washed my face, came to the captain and told him everything as it happened.